martial arts is very humbling. It is not like ballet. It's a good, well, it's a humbling in a way that I like, I guess. Um, it's what I tell parents when they ask me like, oh, should I put my kid in martial arts? I say yes, because it is the best delayed gratification model to ever exist. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I'm joined today by Jay Schindler. We're going to have some fun. I, I I have a feeling. I just, I would put money on it. I don't have any money on me, but pretend I had money. I'm, I'm putting money on it. This is going to be a good one. Glad you're here. Audience, remember, if you're new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, transcripts, links, photos, videos, all the good stuff, all the stuff that we reference in episodes that you're all in your car and you say, hey, man, I can't take notes while I'm driving because I don't want to die. Well, that's where you go. You go back and then you click on the link in your podcast player and you go to the website and check that out. And of course, whistlekick.com for all the things that we do, the events, the products, training programs, Whistlekick Alliance, all the good stuff that we make here at Whistlekick for all of you, the traditional martial artists of the world. But Jay, I've been looking forward to talking to you for a while. Yeah, I kind of kept you on your toes too. Um, and yeah, yeah, Zeno a little was bit. Gonna come and then did it. That's, but you know, <laughs> the martial artist thing, you're never going to know my next move. But yeah. I am really oh, happy here. Oh, are we are we are we suggesting that your reschedule had some some ninja elements to it? Was that? Oh, absolutely. Martial okay. arts is so mental. So it's it was about that. It had nothing to do with okay. the fact that I am a disorganized person. <laughs> and yeah, but no, super glad to be here. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, uh, I've been following you on TikTok for a while, probably as long as I've been on TikTok, which I, I think is like three years at this point. Wow. Which You were there at the beginning then. I, I guess. Yeah. I think that's kind of when I started. Well, I started TikTok trying to just be like a comedian because I did comedy in college and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And then I started watching Cobra Kai like around that time. I had not watched any of the first seasons or anything like that. So, and everyone kept talking about it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go start watching the show. And I kept seeing people on TikTok do like recreations of dances that they had seen in shows. And I was like, why not, why not do recreations of like martial arts moves? And so I think my, the first biggest video, which was only the third video I posted recreating a Cobra Kai move was Hawk's Superman punch in the mall cafeteria fight scene. Um, I wish I was like super with it and pulled like the episode code right now, but I don't, I just know it's like in the earlier seasons. And um, if if you look really closely, this is a fun tidbit that nobody knows. I think that's the, the last episode of season two. I think you're right. Um, if you look really closely in that video, um, I am wearing ballet tights under my jeans because my sister told me to take the ballet class at BYU because it changed her life and it did change my life, but not for good reasons. And I didn't, not really, I just didn't like it. I, I have so much respect for ballerinas. Like I already did. The bar was already high, but now the bar is like insurmountable. It's, it's if you ever want to be humble. Is this the literal bar on the, the side of the room? Yes. By the mirror? Okay. Yes, exactly. Is that, it, is that why it didn't go well? Cause it was the bar was insurmountable. Well, here's the thing. I was like, I've been a martial artist my whole life. Like, I will look not stupid. That was what I thought. My, that's where my expectations were. I didn't think I was going to be good. I was like, I'll just not look dumb. I was wrong. Um, Did they, you look dumb? Oh my gosh. I can send you the video. I, I send it to my friends. Can you please? Okay, I will. I, I, I don't necessarily need to share it with everyone, but I do. You want can. To it's on TikTok. If you, okay. you have to scroll down really, really far. Um, because for your midterms, you had to be filmed for all the mm. things you learned. And then you had to assess yourself, which was even worse. I would rather have someone tell me how bad I am than for me have to rewatch the videos of me failing at ballet. I was bad. I was one of the worst ones in the class and it was bad. Was everyone new to ballet? Most, most of There were like a few girls that were taking repeats, but the worst thing is, is you're in a leotard too. So like you already feel awful about how you're doing, but then they put you in a leotard and tights and you feel even worse. And so I would do these Cobra Kai moves after ballet to get my self-esteem back because <laughs> I've been 
so bad. Hold on, let me do something that I know I'm I, I can do not terribly. I'm ready. Yes. Oh, sorry. I thought you were about to do something. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> stealing your shtick. If you if you want to do Cobra Kai moves on on your episode, that's fine. But I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, I wish you I, would. I did not show up prepared with any choreography today. <laughs> you know what? I'm really disappointed in you for that. But that that's okay. I'll I'll let that slide. Gonna, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I'm going to do. So if you watch those early videos, like in parking lots on campus and things like that, you will. It's I am very white. <laughs> like my legs are translucent. But they're even more translucent in those videos because I have actual pink tights on underneath my jeans um, and a leotard even. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's that's how ballet links into Cobra Kai moves. But they did really those videos did really good. And um, it ended up becoming this thing that I couldn't stop doing because I was becoming a better martial artist from it. Um, awesome. You know, if you film yourself doing something, you know, you can critique yourself really well. And as I do these videos and try to get it to look a lot like the shot or the move, I could see like, okay, I'm doing this wrong, or I want it to look more like this. Mm -hmm. And um, also it was the first show of my generation. Like I had grown up watching like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and like the real martial arts nerdy stuff. But, and Karate Kid was, in the 80s was the movie that like did bring martial artists together too but mm -hmm. then we had had something like that in a long time mm -hmm. and cobra kai also brought martial artists together and so it was a really great way to get martial artists to come and find my account and then i was just creating this followers of just martial arts nerds and man there's no better group <laughs> there there truly is there's no better people than like a martial arts following crew and so um between getting more followers of not to have more numbers, but to just have a bigger community of martial artists was a drive. And then also seeing myself get better over time was a drive. And at this time I was also training um, with my instructor in Salt Lake. And so it was just kind of a way to like gamify my training, I think is how mm. I put it. Okay. Because training can be like hard. Well, it's always hard, but it can be intellectually hard, you know, mm -hmm. like, and it, it, martial arts is very humbling. It is not like ballet. It's a good, well, it's a humbling in a way that I like, I guess. Um, it's what I tell parents when they ask me like, oh, should I put my kid in martial arts? I say yes, because it is the best delayed gratification model to ever exist. Hmm. Like we live in a time that's all about instant gratification. Social media is that. Um, and I see these kids who just, even my brothers, my younger brothers, who are just used to getting it so fast, getting it. And I work in advertising and we're literally trying, you are taught to try to grab someone's attention in one second because you lose it in mm -hmm. one, if not two seconds. Like, and so our whole, everything is going towards that, all media, all advertising. And you do not get any instant gratification in martial arts. It's, it's hard. It doesn't come naturally to anyone, which I love because I'm not very coordinated, actually. Um, you, you're seeing mm, come no, on. No, no, no. Hey, hold come on. on. You're seeing me at the end of my journey. Not the end. It's not the end. It's the middle because, but I'm saying if you would have seen me growing up or if you we're see, not seeing you at the beginning, mm -mm. like if you, if you see me try to play golf, it's, it's really funny. It's a fun time, but I look awful when I, this is a good, this is a good example. When I was young, I ran so awkwardly. My dad, I did not know this till last year. My dad wanted to take me to the doctor because he thought something was wrong with me because I ran so awkwardly. My sister likened it to like a drunken baby gazelle. Um, I have really long legs. I still do. Comes in handy in sparring, but mm -hmm. I couldn't really figure them out. It's like a newborn fool. Um, so I, I've just always been awkward, but I've always wanted it so bad that I'm willing to work hard enough to make it right. And martial arts is great because even those that are coordinated and get it quicker still have to work really hard to get it right. And so I felt much more safe and at home walk, feeling like everyone was kind of struggling together. Even if they were like way better than me at something, they were still struggling. And, you know, and um, so you have a delayed gratification model. You have to work really, 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 really hard to get a little bit better, not to get perfect 
not to get the perfect free throw shot, not to get like, you work really, really, really hard to get better. Um, And you see this even at like, at least in my favorite arts, like you see this forever, like after Black Belt, after Dawn, like you're still working your tail off to get better. Even at least like our grandmaster, even with HC Huang, he's still working hard to get better. And he's in his seventies and he's the best martial artist I've ever been able to witness. And so I love that. I love that that um, is being facilitated and being taught still, because I think it's like the perfect cure to what's maybe not going great in society right now. I agree. I, I say often that traditional martial arts is like this magic puzzle piece that fits in with whatever is lacking in someone's mm-hmm. life, whether you know it's a small child or an, or an adult. And yeah. if you've been training a while, that resonates. People tend to understand what I'm saying there. You mentioned you've been training your whole life. So, so what does that look like? When did you get started, and why? If, yeah. if you were if you were so physically <laughs> awkward that there was concern about perhaps your physical development, why were you in martial arts? So I always did sport. I always loved sports, um, and so I was doing soccer from four years old and playing pretty much any sport my parents would put me in. I wanted to do, I loved the like social interaction and I loved the mental physical challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was, we were, this is, is so funny cause it's my seven year old brain. And what stands out is that I was going to Awana's, which is this, I think it's Baptist. I'm not sure. It's just this like church group that you meet on Tuesdays and go and play all these games and learn about mm-hmm. Jesus and my sister and I really liked it because we liked the games at the end and we were very competitive. Like I was a really great crab walker. If anything at seven, I could crab walk like nobody's business. And I always won that one. And um, my mom was like, hey, our friends have just started this martial arts class. Do you guys want to try it out? But if you do it, you can't go to Awana's. And in my head, I'm like, nothing's going to be Awana's. Like, okay, like I'll try this thing, but I don't think, but I was excited still. Like I thought it'd be cool. And when I grew up in a town of 1100 people, like Mm. I'm talking like tiny, tiny. And so it's pretty big when like somebody new comes to town, you know? So I went, um, we did it in the Grange Hall, which like we never did it there again, but I remember that that's where it was that time. And I stood in line and there was a lot of new people there that day. Like all my sisters were new and my dad even tried it. And we learned front kick that day. And I was like, this is it. Like this, I, there's something about this that um, really speaks to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Any idea what it was? I don't know. I I think part of it was that I'm, I'm one of six kids and it was a moment where like martial arts, even though you're all there together in a room and there is a community aspect, it is very individual. And I hadn't experienced an individual sport up until that point. And the instructor specifically like made a few notes for me because he could see how excited I was. And I'm very outgoing, I always have been. And um, so I'm like yelling as loud as I was not a kid that you had to try to get to key up or yell, I was like screaming from the first day. And I think he saw that excitement. And so he was kind of facilitating it even in the first lesson and to get that kind of individual attention as someone from six kids and stuff like that. I was like, okay, this is so cool. This is my journey. I don't think I would have articulated this is my journey at seven years old, Mm -hmm. but that's what I would say it felt like to me. Um, Me and my sisters were pretty much dedicated from that day on, at least to me and my two older sisters, not my oldest, we all, my family all did it at a time, but it was us three and my dad who trained the longest. And um, my old, my second oldest sister is very talented martial artist. She was kind of the, the star. And I just remember (laughs) she didn't like us to do her things. She didn't like us when she did soccer and then we were like, oh my gosh, let's play soccer. Or she did this and we're like, oh my gosh, let's do this. Cause it's pretty common among the older yeah. siblings when the younger siblings follow. Exactly. And so she kind of thought that's what we were doing when we started. Like, oh, you guys are just doing this because I'm doing this. But I think it after a few years, she was like, oh, no, they're doing this because they like it or else they would have quit mm-hmm. by now. 
And it was fun training as a family and having something uh, together. So I think that's another thing that kept us. But the funny thing was, is Crin, so Crin's four years older than me and she's the second oldest one who's really good. And so if you think about the age difference, that's like seven to 11 and, or it was 10 to 14. So there were big age gaps then where like, I couldn't actually compete with her at the time. Mm -hmm. I think a good way to articulate this is we were sparring one day and I went to punch her and she grabbed my, my arm. Then I punched her with my right hand. She grabbed my other arm. So I went to knee her and she put my own arms in a low cross to block my own knee. And, but it was all in real time. I'm telling you, and we, it happened and we both went, oh my gosh, like, whoa. But then of course we're in a traditional art. So my instructor's like, get it together. But we can't stop laughing because it was a karate kid moment. And we had to run laps the rest of the class, but it was worth it. Like I'd do it again because it was, but that's like, that was the level where she was at sparring and where I was at sparring. But I didn't know that. I thought I always had a chance when I was younger, um, which is, but that's my mindset. And Are I any of them still training? So Kryn is, um, so Kryn and my dad got their black belts, their Dons first. Mm -hmm. And we actually trained, so we were Tung Sudo growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, my instructor, um, they're kind of just an offshoot. They just like stopped going to the Federation events. And then, so we went to his instructor to test for our Chodon. Kryn test first. And then I tested for my Chodon two years later and she tested for her Edon while I tested for my Chodon together. And then our instructor moved to Alaska, of all things, and uh, they wanted to run the Iditarod. I can't tell you, you know, you know, martial artists, it's like where the odds are good, but the goods are odd. I don't know. Like they- I've never heard that, but I like that. A lot. That's an Alaska saying because uh, Alaskans are very strange, but they're the best, coolest people, but they are unique because it takes a special type of person yeah. to live. And my dad's- from Alaska. So wow. I, I can say this and I was born in Alaska. So I feel oh, like, okay. you know, I'm allowed, I'm, I guess I'm allowed to say this or maybe I'm not, but either way, I'm going to, I'm going to claim it. Um, and so, yeah, he left. And then at that point I was kind of going through the, like, I want to play other high school sports. Um, my instructor was very demanding. I would say he's very old school. Like, mm -hmm you're doing push-ups if you're not loud enough you're we are in straight lines if you don't get there fast enough we're doing it again we're doing conditioning I, I classes yeah. yeah this is very much like the muda kwan um started like you know started after the war and then it was taught a lot on the air force bases and it reflected as such um you know and so and my instructor was keeping that tradition alive which i liked like i really like having grown up in that but when you're 14, 15, and your instructor is maybe kind of, I feel like expected a little bit too much from me, like wanting me to take over the school. And like at 15, I just didn't feel, well, I was a people pleaser. And so I was like, I have to do this or it's gonna die. And my dad's like, maybe, maybe just be a teenager. And I'm like, straight up, I didn't know I could do that. Um, so after he left, I just started doing other sports. I had already been doing them because when you're small town, you do everything. You don't have to try out. You just, they want you to come. So mm -hmm. I was doing all of the sports and this jujitsu instructor moved into our town. And I was like, well, I guess I'll go try a class. And I was instantly in love. Um, his name is Harry. Uh, he is one you of- You were the in love with Harry or with jujitsu? Well, yes, I'm in love with Harry in a non-weird way because he's okay. like a grandfather figure to me and is like the sweetest, kindest human, but it I had to ask you, you, you made that in big, I, I, and, and it's a podcast. So I'm really glad that you did, yeah. um, clarify that. But Harry is like a very, very wholesome was only training, like very elite jujitsu mm. and judo athletes, but then felt like he needed to give back to the world. Mm. And so he was only charging us enough to pay his rent for like the community center for his classes. And he did um, Donzon Ru Jiu Jitsu, which I'd never heard of before, um, which is, for those of you who don't know, is like the Japanese Hawaiian iteration of Jiu Jitsu. It looks um, more akin to Judo, I would say, um, just because there's a lot of throws. They start you out with throws. They're not starting you on the ground as much. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved it because there was also a healing aspect. So you had to learn massage for your tests and you had to demonstrate, of course, all your throws and all your 
hand techniques and all your kata, but then you also had to do massage. And I loved just the aspect of like, you're learning to fight and you're also learning to heal. And um, I also always knew that my ground game was extremely weak and that I wanted to be a more well-rounded fighter. And also the falls and rolls are so fun. And I think every person alive should learn to roll and fall. Mm-hmm. Um, which came in handy a lot when I did my Cobra Kai stuff, because there's, when you're, when you do stunt work, you got to be able to fall and to throw and to be thrown. It's true. So I did that till college. And then, um, I just didn't do anything in college for the ballet. Huh? Except for ballet. Except for ballet. Yeah. I You didn't do any martial arts training through college? I did in the end. So I started, I, I think without like getting too into it, I, I just had kind of a bad taste in my mouth of how things ended with my instructor. And it was just kind of a weird situation towards the end. He was well-meaning, but I just a lot of pressure and like a little bit of manipulation to try to get me to stay. I didn't like that. And so it was at the point and where my brain development was at the time too, I could not separate like my love for Tung Sudo and like that negative experience that I had. And so I was like, I'm just going to stay away from it. Cause that's how you solve that uncomfortable feeling is just like <laughs> not doing it is what I thought. And then I, um, about like sophomore year, I started to really miss it. Cause at that point I hadn't done Tung Sudo for four years, five years. Uh, I'd done jujitsu, but I hadn't done um, Tung Sudo. So we have family in Utah. And when we travel and visit them growing up, we'd go and see this instructor who lived in Salt Lake who did Subokto. And so I knew there was an instructor in Salt Lake. So I just reached out to him one day and I said, hey, can I come to a class? And he was like, absolutely. So I rode the front runner up, which is like the train. And I went to his class and first thing he said, well, first of all, he lined me up with the Dons and I didn't want to be there. I'm like, put me in the back of the room. Like I haven't, and he's like, no, you're a Don. Like you've earned it. You have to be the Don. You showed up with your black belt though. Huh? You showed up with your black belt. Like a martial arts uniform I had. Like what was, was I, so I, I like, um, he puts me in the Don line and goes, okay, everybody get into your splits. And I said, mm, I don't have a splits. What? So I'm getting down as far as I can, but it's like instant sweating bullets. And then the next thing he had us do was, um, this is an exercise that I love. It's great for building your hip flexors. I love it now. I didn't at the time. You sit cross-legged with like in butterfly position with like your feet together. And then somebody comes behind you. They put their, your, their hands on your shoulders and they step on your knees. And then you have to lift your knees up while they're standing with all their full weight on you and your hip flexors will cry quite literally. And um, he had us do that next. So it's kind of like a half a conditioning class. And then we started working material and I was literally crying. <laughs> you couldn't tell because I was sweating so hard, but um, I, when I was in pain too, I did not realize like how much flexibility I had lost, how much muscle I had lost. Like my feet hurt really bad. How many years had it been? Five. Five. And um one thing that you, if you start as a child martial artist and then you've never taken a break you like are very humbled by having now just like a normal adult body um especially feet muscles if you stop for a long period of time you don't know you have them until you don't have them and so my feet were like hurt so bad especially by my ankles from like a horse stance you know and having just that Um, and so I left and I was like, I'm never coming back. And then I got on the train and I felt better than I had in a long time. Just that like after martial arts high that you only get from martial arts. And I said, just kidding. I'm of course I'm coming back. And I was pretty sporadic because I was in college and Mm -hmm. I just wasn't, I was working through still that kind of pain from how I ended my last martial, like Tung Sudo martial arts. And so I just wasn't sure what I was going to do, but my master Carlos was so understanding, super kind, like invited me over to dinner. His wife cooked me dinner, like the first class I ever went to, like, and his kids are just the best kids I've ever met. They're Mm -hmm. now like my family They're I like see them like my little siblings they are amazing, amazing kids. 
And um, so even that was like keeping me coming back, but I stopped for a while and then I woke up one day and I heard this, heard this voice and it was like, if somebody asks you to do something today, you need to do it. And in my head, and like, I, you know, I'm going to BYU, I'm going to a Christian college. Mm-hmm. And in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be asked to serve somebody in some way today, you know, and I'm going to make somebody's life better. Like that's where my <laughs> head goes. And then Master Corrales called me um, and he said, hey, my instructor is going to teach this like breathing healing seminar tonight. You should come up. And I hadn't been up for like probably three months. And I was like, okay. Cause I had had that prompting. Like if yeah. somebody asked you to do something, you, you do it. Yes. And I knew that that was the thing, yeah. but I didn't think it was about me. Um, and so I went up and I was, I was dealing with like, I was pretty depressed at the time um, and felt pretty alone. I'd gone through like a bad breakup. And even before the breakup, I was still just like having a hard time. So his instructor teaches this amazing healing breathing seminar. That was just phenomenal as someone with asthma i don't think i have reached those areas of my lungs since like i don't know he's he's insane and then he gave this whole little spiel at the end of like how beautiful in martial arts and in traditional martial arts especially it is to experience the spiritual side of existence and how we live in a very secular world that doesn't want to acknowledge any type of spirituality Mm -hmm. and as somebody who is a christian like it is I live that way, but to hear somebody talk about it in the same way that I believe in like a martial arts aspect and how at least like our martial arts brings in spirituality, it was so cool. I'm like, no wonder I feel so connected to this community because we all agree like in this way. And so then um, Corella Sabanim comes up after the class. He's like, how'd you like it? I was like, I loved it. He goes, okay, well, you're coming for the tournament tomorrow, right? I said, what tournament? I was like, no, I haven't, like, I'd only gone to probably four classes, maybe five classes of his. And again, hadn't trained for five years. He's like, oh, you got to come. You got to come. And I was like, okay. And I now know, having seen him, like, fellowship other people, that he was going to ask me that. He had it all planned out of, like, how he was going to do the cell. Um, And so I came the next day. And I did the tournament. I did awful and young. I always do awful in like, which young or kata or, you know, like I, I, I never do very good. Um, and, but I love it. And then I'm a sparring junkie and I ended up getting first in sparring and which was cool. Cause I hadn't done it for so long, but growing up, we sparred every class and had sparring classes on Saturday where we come and spar for just an hour. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it it was in my blood, you know, and I may not have the best technique or anything, but I have good timing and I have a lot of heart and it invigorated me, uh, Mm -hmm. gave me a little bit of like, oh my gosh, I am good at this. Like, and I didn't stop from then I tested for my Dawn a a few months later. Cause I, you have to retest for your Dawn. Mm -hmm. Tungsudo and Subakdo, I don't know if you're familiar, but they're like, cousins so mm-hmm. i'm gonna give everybody a little history lesson for those who don't Please know do. i love 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 to talk about this so the muda kwan was created in 1945 by huang Qi, and it's kind of a mixture of shotokan tai chi shaolin long fists and a few other styles he was a huge martial arts nerd he trained in china during um world war ii because the japanese were inhabiting korea and so um he came he could finally have his own art once World War II ended, which is why it's 1945, um, because they weren't allowed to do martial arts before then. And they called it, he called it the Muda Kwan, but you, people know it as Tung Sudo. And they named it Tung Sudo because even though it looked a lot like karate, they didn't want to give any nod to the Japanese because they weren't happy with the Japanese at the time. So they took it all the way back to China, to the Tang Dynasty, and they called it Tung Sudo. And he actually called it Huasudo first, but that meant like way of the flower hand and nobody wanted to learn flower hand uh, way because yeah, you know, just doesn't really give like the image of what you want to learn stepping into a martial arts studio. And so people were calling like Tung Sudo was just a common way to say like karate style without saying karate because they didn't want to say karate. Mm -hmm. So 
in Korea at the time, they were just saying like Tang Sudo was kind of the way, but his school was the Mudokwan. So it was Tang Sudo Mudokwan. And quickly they became the like the it factor of Korea. Um, mm -hmm. And then after the Korean War, they wanted to create a sport like American had America had baseball. It's now football, but it was baseball at the time. Like that was our sport. That's what brought us together as a nation. Now it's football. And because when they, after the Korean War, they split, they had no nationality as South Korea. They didn't have an identity. So they said, let's make a sport where we can all have this come together. The Muda Kwan, there was five main Kwans, five main schools, Kwan means school at the time that all came together. And um, Muda Kwan was bigger than the other four combined. That's mm -hmm. how big it was um, to create Taekwondo. When Huang Ki realized that it was become going to become more of a sport, he pulled out because he wanted it. He had worked so hard to make this art that was a nod to like Korean heritage, traditional Korean martial arts, traditional Chinese martial arts. He worked really hard to create the vision he wanted, and he knew that that was going to not mm -hmm. be a thing in Taekwondo. And that doesn't mean that like some people get really like fired up and like, oh, well, I don't like Taekwondo. I'm like, oh, that's not what I'm saying. Taekwondo is an amazing art and it's an amazing sport. I would say it's more of a sport. Um, people, if people are offended by that, I'm sorry. But Depends on the school mean, you go to. Huh? Yes. Depends on the school. Yes. And I'll get into that too. And because it also depends. The other thing about Taekwondo is like, that doesn't mean anybody is less than an athlete. Most, all the Taekwondo athletes are more athletic than I am. I mean, look at the, look at the level they're competing at. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think most Taekwondo schools have lost part of the art, I would say. They still have it there. It's still there. Um, but they are more sport, in my opinion. Nobody has to agree with me. However, when um, General Choi, who is, it's funny, he's seen as this like, hero figure in any of the taekwondo world he Depends is not who you talk to as a hero figure in the muda kwan world because he actually made it illegal for anyone to practice anything but taekwondo in korea so huang ki was faced with the um and i man i have seen the receipts hg huang is his son who i've trained with many times who is like our kwan Janim right now and he pulls up the receipts of the legal proceedings like it's insane. And what's really cool is like, I'm hearing from a secondary source. No, I'm not hearing from a primary source. None of us can hear from primary sources, but I at least am hearing the story from a secondary source and one who is, it was his father. So yes, he's probably, people would say he's biased and I would agree because we're human, but also he was there even when it was happening. Like H.G. Huang is also a primary source in a different way. And it was hard for them because they're like, okay, well, our art's going to die if we don't figure out a way around this, because mm -hmm. these people who were practitioners, it was their job was to be a martial arts teacher. So they couldn't just like say, okay, well, I'm just gonna teach Muda Kwan because then they, you know, be like arrested. <laughs> so um, they taught Taekwondo, but they would actually teach Muda Kwan, some, some of them, not all of them. Some of them would teach Taekwondo, but they were teaching Muda Kwan. So then you'll see these people who are now training Taekwondo Muda Kwan those lines look much more traditional. And I would say, are, so that's what you're saying. Like, it depends what Taekwondo practitioner you're talking about. Because there are very, very traditional, looks a little bit more like Tang Soo Do, <laughs> but also it's Taekwondo. It's like a mixture and still knows their line, knows their heritage, hasn't lost like tradition. You'll see those Taekwondo schools that exist out there that are phenomenal. Um, but that's why they exist that way. Um, and then... So Huang Ki decided to go to um, the Air Force bases. That's the way he found around it is, and that's where Chuck Norris first started training and Victor Martinov and all those greats. And cause he knew that it would exist through the USA. And what's funny is of course our Federation in the USA is way bigger than where if you ask anybody from Korea, what Tung Sudo or Subak Do is, they look at you like you're crazy. They're like, oh, you do Taekwondo? And they get really excited because they do have a lot of pride around it. I love it. It makes me so happy when like I can relate to um, somebody who's Korean in that way of being like, yes, I love your heritage and your country and they get excited and it's great. But um, I don't even know why I started this tangent. It's other okay. than I love it's, to talk. It's okay. If you, if you dig the history side of things, this is for you and for the audience. Uh, Alex Gillis's book, A Killing Art. I don't know if you've read it, Jay. Mm -hmm. Alex was on the show years ago. It's a phenomenal book. He's a, a investigative journalist and he went super deep 
Uh, it is, as far as I'm concerned, the definitive work on the history of Taekwondo. And mm. a lot of the early days that you're talking about are discussed in there. So and know, a lot the of the, go, go check out that book. Alex did a great job. A lot of the people who like a lot of the Taekwondo greats were originally Mudokwan greats, not all, but a good amount, which is what I love when I meet somebody who does Taekwondo or Tung or anything is we're all from the same Rupa, like we're all from the same lineage. Mm -hmm. We can trace ourselves back to Huang Ki and we're just a big family. And that's how H.E. Huang talks about it. And that's what I love. I know I started this. I started this because I switched from Tung to Subak Do. Oh, yeah. And I, okay, this is my my perception before I started Subak Do. As someone in Tung Sudo was, those people breathe way too much. They sound weird and they look soft. Like that, that was my impersonation of Subak Do. I remember like going to a Master Kralis' class when I was younger and everyone's like, Tch. and I'm like, y'all are weird. Y'all are strange and you sound weird. And then when we'd spar them, I was like, you're not good. <laughs> like, come at me, bro. Cause we were very like, hard style look like 70s tongue sudo like because when my instructor stopped when francis master francis stopped he stopped in like 80s and stuff so he looked like 80s tongue sudo like we just looked we were frozen in time of what it looked like then and so when i started subakdo i had my i was like i don't know i'm glad it's here and i'm glad to train but it I'm sounds not... like you were reluctant yes I was happy to have an instructor and Kerala Sabanim is an amazing practitioner. Somebody once said about him, like, if you want to see the art personified, watch mm -hmm. Corrales. And I think that's a great way to explain like how he moves. He moves so well. And um, I could see him and I'd be like, I want to look like him, but I'd see his students and I, who are good, but like, it wasn't what I was used to seeing. I was used to seeing like a lot of fire energy, like a lot of snap, a lot of quick, a lot. Of, and I wasn't seeing that in his students, but I wanted to look like him. And so um, I now have a different perspective of his students, but this is what I felt like at 19, like watching his classes. And his, my second class that I came, um, he stuck me in the back of the room <laughs> for 20 minutes and he gave me a chair. And what he was working on is he had me lift my knee up and then do a front kick and push the chair. So only like the front feet come off the ground and then you bring your knee back in and then you bring it down. What this is training is a front thrust kick, not a front snap kick. Mm -hmm. You have to bring your knee up high enough that your weapon shows and then you extend out and you use your hip. It's a little bit, it's slower than a snap kick, but it's much more powerful. I think like a good way of explaining it is think of like a Muay Thai teep. It looks mm -hmm. more like a teep than it does um, the classic like karate snap kick. It's, it is a different kick. And I had like, first of all, man, I was in muscle failure in like 30 seconds and I had to do it for 20 minutes because my quads were gone. <laughs> and, but um, I remember about six months in, I started to feel the difference of what it felt like to move more fully mm -hmm. and to really experience the push and pull. Like um, before I was just pushing and I had no pull, there was no fullness of movement. And I realized that sometimes something can look beautiful and soft and it's actually stronger because you're moving more effectively. Mm -hmm. And an ease, when there's an ease of movement, sometimes it looks soft but it's not i think like bruce lee is a good example of this you want to think he was like as powerful as he was but he demonstrated many times how powerful he was because when you have effectiveness of movement like anyway and so i just i my testimony of subakdo grew more and more and what i would say is the difference is tongue well technically in subakdo they're teaching tongue sudo till dawn mm -hmm. it's all hard style material you learn like soft style and middle way style after you're a Don. But in to, at least in my school in Tung Sudo and other Tung Sudo schools I've experienced, they um, they teach hard style with more gusto. And they focus a lot more on like energy and the energy of a martial artist, which I love and I like to do with my students. Um, and kind of that where Subak Do focused on technique like so much that I think it slows down your the students sometimes. Everybody looks the same by the time they get to the highest levels. However, it's just a different approach to training. 
And the reason I they did this was because when Huang Qi and H.G. Huang visited all the schools back in like the 90s, everyone looked different. Everyone was doing something else and they weren't looking like the picture that of like the art of what it was supposed to be. So they standardized all the material. This is when people split. And this is when now you have a lot of Tung Sudo schools walking away because they didn't like the standardized. They didn't like being like, I mean, if you're running a very successful school that, and you're doing well for yourself and then somebody tells you like, hey, you actually have to train it this way. Like people are going to walk away just from a business standpoint, not even from like a personal standpoint. So it makes sense why, but they focused a lot on like the technique of movement. And that's been the inf emphasis for the last 20 years. Now the emphasis is coming back to bringing in the snap back and bringing the fire back. And so I think you're going to see like, um, my impression is Subakdo is going to start looking faster than it has. They slowed down all the hyung and everything because people were doing it wrong. And now they're like, okay, everyone consistently is teaching the technique correctly. So let's like, H.G. Huang will be like, okay, well, I'll like give it something, you know? Mm. And so um, I understand when people are like, Subakdo looks soft. I'm like, I thought that also. And sometimes I like, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm telling you, having been the sparring partner <laughs> of one boy they're not and the highest level like there is a very consistent um requirement for each belt level which i love there's a lot asked of you for each belt rank and each test it is very consistent it is the same and by the time you're seeing somebody at fifth degree or fourth degree they look good they look so good and it does give a lot of pride in the art for me to like see that because that's not a given in arts these days. Um, there's a lot of great ones who do it right. And there's people who are trying their best to do it right, but just don't have the resources or, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that's something I've come to really love about Subakdo. Nice. Okay. So that just gave us a really good picture on start, why, how, up to now. So I'm going to ask you a question I ask often. Why are you still training? Wow. Um, this is something that crossed my mind many times because when I graduated college and moved out here to Texas for a job, that was would have been a natural breaking point to stop. Um, but martial arts gives me so much peace of mind. Um, I think... I sometimes talk about it as it's kind of a reflection of where my life's at in the moment. You can see when I'm struggling with training is often when I'm just struggling in general, but having something that I always can progress on, there's always something to do and it's predictable. Like I know what I need to do next for my next spell test um, is super nice, but the bigger part of it is definitely the community. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. I cry really easily. And it's fine. Okay. Take your time. I, um, I've been really sick. You're recently. not the first person to cry on this show not by a long shot. And I won't be the last, I hope. Um, I've been really sick recently and so much so that I can't train. Um, mm. I do a lot of breathing and I do a lot of like the very soft side, like Tai Chi level, um, stuff, but, um, I wasn't able to go to nationals this year and I don't care about the competition. Do I love the competition? Yes. Am I super competitive? Yes. Do I love being a part? Like I've been, I've represented a lot of the team sparring teams. Um, I have a lot of pride in that, but it, the thing is I just didn't get to see everyone because they're, it's just the best people, kind people, martial artists are so kind. I think if you stick with it, you know, anybody, any art doesn't matter. Like if you stick with it for a long time, you got some good human qualities. <laughs> mm. You're kind, you're compassionate, you're humble. Um, and you want to pass on like your knowledge to the next generation in a weird way. Of, I guess that's like a big way of saying it, but like, there's just like a give back mentality, just like how I mentioned with Harry and Jiu Jitsu, like there's that where you just want to help each other. Mm. And it really sucked not seeing everyone. Um, and so for me, that's what I think has been keeping me going. Even when um, my belt test got pushed, my instructor certification test got mm. pushed. Don't know when it'll be. Um, I'll do it. <laughs> don't know when. <laughs> um, but the bigger thing has always just been not seeing people, you know, so. Mm. 
It sounds like a, a, a tough time, but the irony I would imagine is that part of what's getting you through that tough time are some of the lessons that you've learned from your training, which probably yeah. makes it both better and worse. Exactly. I think the funny thing is, is like martial arts is where I turn when my life goes crap. Like mm. I train harder when things are harder. I train harder. Like that's what I do. I just, cause if I'm super anxious or how my have all these like bad thoughts going on, I'll just train for more hours because I focus in on, mm. you know, no matter what I'm doing, especially with young practice, like you can't think about other things while you're trying to do your technique. Right. And I haven't been able to do that. And I'm lost. I'm like, what do I do? Because this is what I have done for the last long, long time. Even when I wasn't training actively, I would still do Hyung practice when I was really stressed because it gave me that peace of mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm not at a point where I can tell you like what I'm going to do. Cause I don't know. Um, there, there, I, I've got some friends. This, this is not so much coming for me, but I'm going to share it. I have some friends who if they were in the room, they would steal the microphone from me and say, visualize, <laughs> right? I, I've got a, a few friends who are really big. Uh, Josh Blum comes to mind on the visualization side of martial arts. And so whether that works for you, I'm throwing it out to the audience as well that, you know, sometimes, because if you, if you want to talk about having to focus when you're physically moving, you can go on the autopilot. But if you're visualizing, that's all you've got is the mental side of things, right? So being able to dig in and say, all right, where's this move? Where's this move? And, and, and I'll just speak from personal experience. The last time I competed, which was a, a little while ago now, the visualization was half of my training. Mm -hmm. And uh, just I'll, I'll modestly say it worked. You don't have to modestly say. You can yeah. show me videos and tell me because yeah. I would love that. <laughs> I know the visualization. I, is I won my division. You know, we'll, right. we'll just, we'll, we'll leave it that way. My forms division. And I think total physic, cause I, cause I only had a little bit of time. I, I lived in a small home and I, I borrowed some space to train. I hadn't competed in 10 years and the form I was doing, I had not been doing actively. What form are you doing? Uh, this comes out of uh, the Ishinu side of my lineage, uh, Kusanku. Oh, I, yeah, I know Kusanku. Which, okay. I, I don't know it, but I know it. Okay. I'm not allowed to know it yet, but I know I have, I know it's my next rank. I'll get to learn it. So, okay. I, I think the one that you, that you do is, is closer to, uh, like Kankadai. I want you to send me and then I will, t I'll let you know. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll compare notes after. But I think between, and, and, and you actually brought this up at the beginning, the, the value of this thing a cell phone mm -hmm. to, as a training tool between yes. my cell phone. I had two sessions visualization. I probably did the form in practice a dozen times, to not a dozen, a dozen sessions, but a, a dozen iterations of the form. Mm -hmm. And I, that was all I needed. And I, I believe a large part of that was because of the visualization. I was able to make each repetition so much better each time through. I love that. And I talk to, I've even told my students that many times. Cause I actually, I teach through digital dojong our like online platform. Mm. And so, and I tell them, I say, as a remote student, the best thing you can do is video yourself and then visualize it. I think my, and this is calling myself out is that I get so frustrated where I'm at, like that I can't do. And so then I avoid like the fact that I can't do my young in the way I want to, that like I'm so limited, then I just get mad. <laughs> and then well, I'm, I'm like, so this sucks. I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. I, th I think we've got enough time in, I can I can do this. And yes. there's, I, I believe wholeheartedly, and I've said this on the show a number of times, that the thing that you are, I, I see martial arts as like a trivial pursuit wheel, right? And we fill in these wedges, right? The pies and the first art you train. And if you train in, you know, five, six, seven years, that's probably the biggest piece. And as we train more and more, we've get these other pieces, but the thing that you are the worst at with regard to your training, whatever that is, that is the biggest piece you can add in. Mm -hmm. It's true. So I'm just going to throw that out there. No, I like that. And it's definitely what I've been trying, but like have been avoiding. So that's, that's good. I, I have gotten a lot better at the breathing exercises, which has been nice because I will have to teach those eventually. And they're great. They really like 
they Can you say more more about that? It, it, yeah, it, it's it, it's it's sounding in my mind like Qigong, but maybe mm-hmm. not. No, it is Qigong. It's it's okay. um, Qigong is like the bigger, and then yeah. it's we call it Mupal Dongkum, which is literally just like breathing exercises for warriors is all it is. Okay. So it's Tai Chi that was specifically used for warriors before they like either went to battle or they just do them every morning. So they're straight from Qigong and from Chinese breathing practices. They're all like, it's all the same. Um, cause our lineage goes back to Chinese, you know, so it, every most does eventually, if you go back far you enough, go far enough and we all end up there. Enough. And, um, but there is like a set, you can do any of them and you can teach it anyway. There's not a lot of regulations when it comes of anywhere in Subakdo. There's usually like, okay, this is specifically what you need to learn, but not with, with this, with Mupal Donkum, they're like, go be a scholar and find whatever breathing exercises you like, and then come teach them. But they have a set that they teach you first, just to like, Hmm. get you to learn. So I've started to memorize those and get better at those. And I challenge anybody to just do Qigong every morning and see if you feel different because the answer is, is you will, <laughs> but you go, how does breathing and moving in this way, like affect so much? Like I'm talking better digestion, like better heart rate. And they've proven it does that, but they can't tell you how it works. And so people don't talk about it as much, but you know, I always feel better when I do it. I haven't, but I, so I'm working on making that my more regular and then doing more visual visualization. I will take your challenge and I will do that more because it, man, when I get back at it, like having memorized everything, if I can do that, like, and just visualize and be there and be present and not avoid, you know, because I'm mad. Cause that's the reality is I'm mad. <laughs> it's okay to be mad. You know, there's, no, like, there's nothing wrong with being mad. No, there's right? not. But it's what you do with that energy, right? You talked about it as fire. And and I don't know if it was intentional, but I, I, I was waiting for you to say fire nation. Like just the way you said fire, I was thinking avatar. Yes. Right. My dog's name is Sozin. So. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, so I didn't guess that wrong. There, it was there. <laughs> okay. All right. I feel better. Uh, but. Now I'm, uh, dang it. I lost my train of thought. Too many, too many tangents. Too many I know tangents. I do that. I do that to a person. I get you That's lost because okay. I go down. That's okay. But the, the value of, of breathing, most of us live in chronic stress, mm-hmm. right? The, our, our body d- was not developed for all of the things that we do and, and prioritizing them as if they are a big deal because they're really not in the grand scheme of us being alive. So our body reacts to that stress and, mm-hmm. and forcing that, that breathing, whatever the breathing protocol is, has a lot of value. It's something I'm personally working on a lot because my my trigger not so much trigger but the the milestone for me is a few years ago i was on vacation and i went and i, I had breakfast and then i went and i went and i had lunch and i realized breakfast had not moved mm. i was so stressed that there, zero digestion happened in that crazy and i went oh, oh we've got to change something here and so that's been a big focus of my personal work the last week. i think like i won't get too far into it cuz i know we're at the end but breath I didn't touch on this when I talked about how weird I thought everybody in Subakdo was with how they breathed. But um, on my way back from my dawn test, Corrales Albanim explained to me that there is like a different breath for each mo- movement that represents different elements. Mm. And um, I watched him after he told me, and he got way into it. It's very cool and very detailed. And any like traditional Chinese art will actually like comes from this tradition. I'd watch and each of his different movements would have a different type of breath. Mm -hmm. And as you, so you look stupid when you're trying it out because you just sound like an idiot trying, like I still sound like an idiot trying to figure it out. But when you do it right and you match the right movement with the right breath, it feels so awesome. And I was like, okay, I'm with it. But like anything in martial arts, you look like an idiot till you get there. And it doesn't matter because we're all just- How do you make progress at anything without looking like an idiot? I know you can't. That's the thing. I, I like- it's just like breathing specifically. I think the best way I can relate to it is like when I'm doing it, you ever go to hot yoga for like the first time and they're just like breathing like crazy. And you're like, what are these people doing? That's how I feel when I do it wrong. I'm like, mm. Mm, I no, nope, that's not, I just feel stupid in a good way. Not in a way that I get mad at myself, but I'm like, oh, that was not it. <laughs> like, I love that feeling. Obvious. That's how I know I'm going to be able to learn stuff. I know. Right. The well, only, anybody who's been through it, and looks back, they don't, they don't look down on you. The only people who look down on you 
and you know, as as content creators, we both experience this, are the people yeah. who claim that they have been through it, but actually haven't want to, and they're too scared to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Those are the only people who are trashing other people making effort. Especially martial artists, the only people hating on you are people who are doing less than you. Like there's never somebody doing more than you who's hating on your content. Right. right. I've learned that. <laughs> With rare exception, once, once in a while. There, you know, you'll once, get- Once in a while, but the majority of people, you know, and, and, you know, maybe this is something we should talk about because, you know, yeah. you, you are, you're a creator. And one of the things I've observed, and we've heard this on the show is that women receive criticism on social media very differently than men do. Yes. And I've, I've watched some of your comments. I've jumped in and, and digitally thrown punches, I guess. I don't know how else to express it. Not because you can't defend yourself, but because we all should be respecting each other. And when that line is violated, that's, that's I where, have, that's when I get upset. I have never once critiqued somebody online, a martial artist. Cause I just love to see people doing martial arts, you know? Yeah. I think, yes, women, this is just an objective statement. Like women, especially female martial artists get much, much, much more hate than men. Not that men aren't getting hate comments and not that people, they aren't dealing with that and that it's not still like affecting people. But there are a lot of my female content creator, martial artist friends have stopped making content. Like um, there's a few that get a lot of hate that I like, uh, I what, uh, locally grown Asian is like, she's one of my favorite people. She does Taekwondo and Muay Thai. She's a phenomenal practitioner. Um, she gets so much hate and I'm like, Oh, that girl can mess you up. First of all, not that that's so it matters, but, um, I, when I started, when that first video went viral, I got so much hate and I realized I had to make a choice then and there, like I can either stop and just not take any of that negative energy in my life. I could just not make content and just not do this. Or I could do it and be the example for like other people, not even, either one, get a community or two, like there was a couple young girls who had reached out to me already that were mm -hmm. like, it's so cool to see a girl doing martial arts. And I had never seen a female master till I was in college in person. Mm -hmm. Like I had not, and it was a like, a, a very important experience for me because I just like not seen it done. And um, so I was like, you know what? I want that. I want to be here. And I want like, I'm not going to let people who are probably living very sad lives and not in a way to like, I f honestly, honest to goodness, feel bad for them because anybody who is in so much pain that they feel the need to put down others is like really going through it. Um, and so I think it's just trying to like reframe what I try to do. Cause it's not that some of them will get to me. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm immune. I am not, but I just try to remember that like those people I think are in a lot of pain. And then to, I work my butt off mm -hmm. and if this is what I look like when I work my butt off. That's okay. And also some of the comments are like very oddly specific of like, I think I get those the most, especially from like, um, I get a lot from Taekwondo practitioners or very traditional karate because very traditional karate doesn't like the way we look often because we are a deviation of their stuff. Like, I don't care what anybody says from the Mudokwan, Tungsudo, or Subakdo. We are deviations from like original karate do, mm -hmm. you know? And so they don't like our iteration, which is most, don't, which I don't care. I'm like, yeah, that's fair. I love your iteration. You guys look great. <laughs> you know? And so it's, or it's like nitpicky, like, oh, you're doing this wrong or you did this wrong. Where really it's just like, we, do it. But, but right. most of those comments come from people who have been training for two to three years, <laughs> just long enough that they think they understand yeah. the entirety of their own system and they don't recognize that there are different, also legitimate ways to do things. And I would have to like, and I have to, I think they're also, no, I don't even think, I know there is also a layer of like, people can't accept the fact that a woman could be a better fighter than them. Cause fighting is seen as this like masculine quality, right. Of like protecting your family. Like don't let them get eat by a saber tooth tiger. Like we're like, you know, that's, that is a manly thing. And so uh, guys have a really hard time yes. even 
they don't i don't think they consciously go this girl could beat me up i feel threatened i'm gonna comment i don't think it's that like cognizant i think it's more just like the fact that a like a girl who looks like she can fight is threatening so they have to take take you down a few notches yeah. um because if they don't it, it makes them feel ad inadequate about themselves it's, yeah. it's something i've I have I have watched. It's not something I have experienced myself because you know I grew up. My primary instructor was a it was a woman, and uh -huh. I started training when I was really young, so I, I saw it. But I also I was aware enough to see some of the things that happen when men wouldn't come through, and and people like want ooh, to. Ignore. It's hard to reconcile that sometimes. It is, and that to me that. I a part of it is programming too in our mm -hmm. like society. Um, I think you just don't have to comment it. You can deal with your own insecurities or like mm -hmm. feel threatened. That's okay. You can feel how you need to feel, but maybe don't hate comment after it. Um, but yeah, but it, that's so much easier. It is. Um, it's even a thing though, from like people who are not from the hate side, but for regionals one time, we actually sparred everyone in like mm -hmm. our region, men and women sparred. We just all competed for the top spots mm -hmm. in the sparring. And I always tell girls, <laughs> the way to get into a guy's head i said and this is this might sound a little sexist and i don't think this this is a generalization to be clear okay so this is like a stereotype if this does not i like the disclaimer i'm excited for this okay if this does not fit you that's okay but from everyone i have talked to this fits men step into a ring thinking they're gonna win women step into a ring thinking they're gonna lose okay mm. so if you have that basis already of like knowing that how can you manipulate it to your advantage because competitive sparring is a huge mental game. Mm. I have beaten, most people that I have beaten are better spars than me. Okay. Mm. Like, better technique. They look better. They're faster. Like, but I'm really good at getting in people's heads and I have a fast enough reaction time that I can make it work. Um, so when I sparred all these guys and this was not the first time, you know, I grew up sparring everyone, any shape and size. And so I doesn't like one. I don't feel very threatened. Do I feel threatened that the person's taller than me? Yes. Faster, stronger? Yes. Of course I do. Like I'm a human, but I know that that guy is so worried about being beat by a girl that it is going to get me to beat him faster. Mm. Not all guys are like this. Most are, especially in my age group. And so what I did with these guys is all you have to do is let, they will advance first. They will attack you first because they're going to try to scare you. Most men will try to scare you right off the bat if you're a girl. And so I teach all girls, just give a good front leg sidekick, a good one. Take the contact warning if you need to. Don't break the rib, like, but give them enough that they're going to be scared because now they're second guessing themselves. She just got a point on me. I can't just run in and advance on her. And she just got a point and I'm worried I'm going to lose. Mm -hmm. And I have very long femurs. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done the perfect proportions where you measure a bone and then put it into this mathematical equation that's supposed to tell you how tall you are. Um, we did this in, in science class in high school and my science teacher thought I did it wrong because my femur says I'm supposed to be 6'3", but it's because I'm literally all legs, which is great because I'm like, even with taller guys, I am, my arms are shorter, but at least my legs are like almost as long. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have a, a pretty good success rate of beating guys in, but I haven't done it like open tournaments or anything. I don't know, I have no idea how I'd fare. But this is just going on. This has been my whole hypothesis that I've been testing sure. as I've done these things. And because and then it's worked. Once once you get that first point on them. But there are other guys that will just continue to rush because they think that they can because it works. Most girls will get scared and they'll especially because they just haven't had the a lot of girls haven't had the experience of sparring guys often. Um with girls is different because they we both are walking in thinking I am the inferior fighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the, for me, I act as if I am operating on, I think I'm going to win. So I walk into that ring going, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I take the male perspective and I go, I'm going to win. I, this is my ring. I, I'm going to beat you. And they think that's what I'm thinking, even though I don't actually think that actually, I think I'm the worst fighter. But if I trick myself into believing it, then they believe that. And then I a beat them. A lot of mental gymnastics happening. I'm telling you, that's all I got. Okay. I don't, I got, I can't oh, do I the actual gymnastics. So I do the mental gymnastics. Um, yeah. And it, it was, I've had a high success rate with it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I like it. Well, it's pretty darn close to visualization. 
it is pretty darn close to visualization. Not that I still put in a lot, a lot, a lot of time on my sparring drills. I still spend a lot of time training. It's not that I'm not putting time in there, but sparring is very mental and I'm very into the like, but at the end of the day, we walk out of that ring. I'm giving you a hug. I'm asking you your name. I want to know about you. Like it's, it's not like I'm mean, but I just, I want you to start asking people. I want you to ask, don't tell in the background, just ask men and women. Like when you walk into a ring, do you think you're going to win or do you think you're going to lose? And not in a way that like, you have to ask in a way you're like, do you think you're going to lose when you walk in a ring? Cause if you ask a girl that she can be like, no, <laughs> but if you put, if you ask in like a group of men and women, like, oh, I've heard that men step into a ring thinking they're going to win and women step into a ring thinking they're going to lose. The girls will say yes. And the guys will say yes. I, I'm, I'm hearing instead of me, I'm hearing content from you. Oh, it's um, anyways, but I, I just think when you're that done. I can even give you a place to write the article to post. It. Oh, I shout out to Marshall journal. Okay. I'm ready. So that's just, I don't know how we started on that, but I, how do we start on any of this? That, that's, that's what we do here on martial arts radio. Right. I press go and chaos happens. And then about an hour later, I press stop. That's, that's the format for this show. It's what we, it's where we are. And I love it. It makes my life exciting. That's awesome. What are people going to find on your, on your social media content other than you uh, uh, mimicking, is that an appropriate word? Yeah, no. Cobra Kai fight scenes. Yeah, I'm leaning a little bit more into the martial arts comedy side of things right now since training is limited. Um, but you'll see a lot of like, I think a third of my content is training tips that I link to back to Digital Dojong. Um, and then martial arts comedy is more than a third recently. And then also just fun kicking videos and or like Cobra Kai recreations. Um, I really like to kick. Kicking is my favorite. And so you're going to see that a lot. <laughs> and some narcolepsy content every once in a while. But... We, didn't, we didn't even talk about that. We didn't <laughs> talk. I kind of wish we had pressed. I, I, had, I had hit record before because I uh, to the audience. We're on for like five minutes and I almost got Jay with a spit take. Like it was, it was pretty good. I affirm. It was pretty... <laughs> uh, what are your handles? Oh, um, at Jay Girl Cook for both, for everything. TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Instagram's the most poppin'. TikTok's the most unhinged. And YouTube is building. So <laughs> okay. yeah, more right long form content coming to that. Awesome. We'll make sure we'll get that stuff linked. And to the audience, thanks for being here. Thanks for riding this out. I know at least two people enjoyed this episode, you and I. <laughs> and if, if maybe, maybe, I'm sure others out there did, but uh, I hope you do go follow Jay because she's doing good stuff and, and she is as funny as she is here. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe, almost, almost. I, I'm, I'm going to take some credit and say you're a little funnier here today, but I prompted that. <laughs> but uh, remember, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the full show notes, whistlekick.com for all the things that we're doing to serve the traditional martial arts, mar art, <laughs> martial artists globally. And Jay, I'm going to pass it to you to close us up. What, what do you want to share with the audience? What final words, thoughts, et cetera, do you want to send them away with today? I think just remember that your journey can look totally different in martial arts than you expect it to. And it's all right. And it's all still a journey. Even if you're like barely training like me, you're still training and you're still with it. And it's just going to make you a stronger martial artist um, at the end of the day and stick with it. Don't, if, if martial arts means to you what it means to like me and Jeremy here, you know, if you feel that in your bones, that gut reaction of that, you love martial artists, keep training. Don't stop. Even when it sucks. And even when it's really hard, cause it always gets better and you always become a better person because of it, not just a better martial artist, but a better human, a better friend, like everything. So just, just don't quit. Not yet. <laughs>